In this short PowerPoint file, I'm going to show how the core of beginning Greek grammar can be captured on one page. This is done by showing how much of the grammar is interrelated, which immensely reduces the amount of memorization. On beginning Greek, uh, bases the core of Greek grammar on what I call eight minimums. And I'm going to mention them uh, first of all, and then show how each one contributes to the whole picture. Here they are by name. Minimum one are the endings of the first and second declensions. Minimum two are the endings of the third declension. Minimum three cover the four basic verb endings in the indicative mode. The fourth minimum along with five are the tense identifiers and the application of those tense identifiers to the four basic verb endings of the previous minimum. Then minimum six deals with the participle and minimum seven deals with the subjunctive and imperative modes. Minimum number eight is given on a separate slide on the um, me verb. Here is the one, the one page. Across the top, I have uh, mentioned the names of the minimums again in case uh, there's a need for clarification or make sure we're uh, staying on the same page. The first two minimums cover the three declensions, first, second, and third. The term declension, of course, means spelling pattern, spelling patterns one, two, and three. A nominative case, for example, is precisely the same for all three declensions. Here we're looking at minimum number one, the endings of the first and second declensions. Now, there are two observations uh, that I want to make here on this first entry. First, the order by columns gives the neuter gender in column two. Other textbooks put the feminine gender in column two following the masculine. This, uh, in my judgment, is an illogical arrangement because the masculine and neuter genders belong to the same declension and their similarities are immediately evident when placed side by side. Second, in the middle column for the neuter gender, you may note that I have given just two forms, the nominative singular and the nominative plural because these are the only two forms that need to be learned for the neuter gender. And of course, the reason for that is simple. All neuter words, all neuter words, nouns, pronouns, adjectives, participles, the accusative form is always exactly the same as the nominative case, singular and plural respectively. And always the genitive and dative forms both singular and plural, are identical with the masculine forms. This, of course, could not be shown if the neuter gender column is located to the right side of the feminine gender. Minimum number two gives us the endings of the third declension. In this declension, the forms for the masculine and feminine are the same. Note that for the nominative singular, and also the accusative singular, there are two possible endings. Some words take one and some the other, but no word ever shifts back and forth. It is one or the other. Again, observe only two endings to learn for the neuter gender. Also, the neuter plural, that's given here, the alpha, is identical with the neuter plural for the second declension. These two minimums give us the endings of almost every noun, pronoun, adjective, and participle in the New Testament for all three genders. Five forms in this method versus 71 forms given in conventional textbooks or 80 forms if the future uh, tense participle is included. 
just five forms in these two minimums, three for minimum one and two for minimum two. How can it be made easier? This third minimum is the most difficult, and I only have students learn it in one assignment when the course is being taught as an intensive in 12 days or so. Otherwise, I split the uh, minimum and cover it in two days. The bold blue center line divides the past tenses from the present and future tenses. These four columns give us what I call the four basic verb endings. The endings of the imperfect tense, active voice in the first column, and middle passive in the second column, provide the foundation for all past tenses in the indicative mode. They are also the endings of the second aorist, which is introduced later. In the indicative mode, the past tenses have an augment in front of the verb stem, an epsilon, which I call the E for earlier, earlier than now, the label at the top of the bold blue line. The emphasis on indicative is because once we leave the indicative mode, only the perfect tense retains the augment. To the right of the bold blue line, the right side of now, are the endings of the present tense, active voice, and then middle passive voices. Probably the most important contribution my method makes is with minimums four and five. These two minimums makes uh, tense identification very simple. Uh, it's often an elusive element for uh, many students. The tense identifiers and their application apply to all verbs in all tenses, voices, and modes, and to all participles, active, middle, passive, and all genders. Certainly an awesome device. The first two uh, tense identifiers above the line, the sigma and the theta eta sigma, are for the future tense. The sigma is for the future active and also the future middle, while the theta eta sigma is for the future passive. Minimum five explains why they are separated from the other tense identifiers. The remaining four tense identifiers below the line are for the tenses left of the now line in minimum three, the past tenses. The sigma alpha is a tense identifier for the aorist active and middle. The theta eta is the tense identifier for the aorist passive. Kappa alpha is the tense identifier for the perfect active. And none, or the absence of a connecting vowel, uh, understood better with minimum five, is the tense identifier for the perfect middle and passive. Minimum five can be stated in two sentences. One, insert the future tense identifiers in front of the present tense endings. And you can see that with the blue line going up toward columns three and four. Number two, replace the connecting vowel. That's going to be the first vowel of the ending, always an omicron or an epsilon, of the imperfect tense endings, the two uh, forms, two columns left of the bold blue line, with the uh, tense identifiers, the tense identifiers that are below the line, uh, below the future tense identifiers. We now move to the uh, participle. And here we build on the first two minimums that covered the declensions. Because the participle is a verbal adjective, its adjective component automatically calls for a declension. Minimum six has two parts divided according to voice. The active voice participle, and this of course includes the aorist passive participle, because the aorist passive is always built on the active model, build on the endings of the third declension, minimum two. All we have to do is put ONT 
in front of these endings to form the present tense participle for the masculine and neuter genders. And there it is. And we put O-U-S in front of the first declension endings to get the uh, feminine active participle. All other tenses follow the same process we did for verbs in minimum number five, the insertion and the replacing. The middle passive participle is probably the easiest form to recognize in the New Testament. Take the endings given in minimum one and insert men in front of them. And Omicron in front of the men gives us the present tense. All other tenses follow the same process we did for the verbs in minimum five. Minimum seven covers the two remaining modes, the subjunctive and the imperative, both modes occurring in just two tenses, the present and the aorist, because we want to show ongoing or point action. The subjunctive is built on the endings of the present tense, columns three and four of the basic four verb endings, the green arrow. In one sentence, lengthen the connecting vowel, which is the first vowel of the ending and always an epsilon or omicron, both of which lengthen to eta or omega respectively. In the second and third person singular, the iota is subscripted. Abbreviated tense identifiers are used to show the aorist, a sigma for the aorist active and middle, and a theta for the aorist passive. The subjunctive is simply to and toson, uh, or rather the imperative is to and toson, uh, and we put an epsilon in front of these two endings for the present tense. And for the aorist forms, we follow minimum five. We replace the connecting vowel, epsilon, with a sigma alpha for the aorist active and middle, and a theta eta for the aorist passive, giving us eto, sato, and theto. The me verb is on the next page. Well, first of all, let me mention here, minimums four and five apply to minimums three, six, and seven. The me verb, which is so complex for many students, I have simplified in very simple, uh, have simplified with very uh, brief uh, instructions. You look for an iota in front of the stem, and that can be the long or short. If you have an iota there, it has to be a present or an imperfect tense. And if it's imperfect, it'll have an augment. If there is no iota in front of the stem, you follow the familiar omega conjugation as we do with the verb luo. Sometimes uh, and many times uh, the me verb has a tense identifier as same as the perfect tense, the kappa alpha, replacing the sigma alpha. But the difference uh, between the aorist and perfect is not all that difficult. Let me show you here, for example, in the verb didomi. And the iota there, of course, is, uh, means that this is a present tense. Uh, but the, uh, without that we're, iota, we're going to have uh, all the other tenses other than the imperfect. And so we have etica for the aorist tense. You see the kappa alpha there. But the perfect tense is going to be dedica. And also then we can see the same thing with tithomy. There's the iota and we, the stem is theta eta, and so you have ethica and tethica.